So we talked about that preparing phrase, uh, phase, and some experts have said the majority of mistakes that are made in church planting are made in that preparing phase because people did not prepare well. So that's just something to keep in mind. Let's move on now to the launch. So now we've prepared the group, we've got our team together, we've, we've done our homework, we, we, we know the community. Now we're ready to move and to really launch out on the ground with evangelism and discipleship. So what are the tasks? Pretty straightforward. You develop the relationships. And again, we'll talk about these, um, we'll talk about evangelism more later. Um, you combine compassion ministries and service ministries with verbal proclamation ministries. You baptize and teach those new believers. Um, you disciple those new believers and you train them to do the same thing. And again, here comes the reproduction. So as soon as somebody comes to Christ, you want to encourage them to share their faith with others. They have those relationships to non-Christians. They know how to speak the language the others will understand. They have a very fresh relationship to Jesus, which is very compelling. So you train them to do that. Um, you form that initial foundational community of, of new believers. Now what will sometimes happen is you'll get other believers who are already Christians who say, I want to join your group. And I always say, do this wisely. You know, when a church is just barely getting started and you don't have very many workers and you're maybe only 10 people or so, you're just happy for anybody who wants to help, right? Sometimes that help can end up being not so helpful later on. And so I'm always very careful in the beginning in assimilating new people when the group is so small. If you get somebody who comes in who's got an agenda that they want to take control or they've got some weird teaching that's their hobby horse, you take somebody in like that, they're going to disrupt that core group. That's, especially for new believers can get confused very quickly. And so I always say be very wise when somebody comes and says, I want to join your group who's already a believer. Be careful that they're not bringing in some agenda, some other vision for something else that's going to end up disturbing the group. Later on when the group is larger, it's not quite as critical, but in the early stages, uh, you may want to follow up. Sometimes I'll say, what church are you coming from? Uh, may I talk to the pastor of that church and find out? And that pastor of that church may say, oh man, look out. <laughs> um, now sometimes it's a good person. Uh, I, I'm not trying to make you be overly suspicious of everybody, but uh, this is just experience speaking here. Uh, this can happen. It can be a problem. Sometimes you get somebody who comes in, they're great. They, they really want to serve and work, and, and that's a good thing. You're glad for the help. Um, begin training those servant leaders, you know, those first disciplers of other disciples. Um, and so the role here is to be the motor. You've got to get things going. But then model ministry, as we've said, in a way it can be reproduced. So you've got that first group of new believers. You're kind of discipling them. They're just starting to sort of gel into a group. And now you're establishing... Um, now, you don't stop evangelism. You don't stop the previous phase. But what you're doing now is you're congregating and maturing that. So they're actually beginning to become a church body. So you're growing and developing this spirit that we are the family of God. We are a new spiritual family. And as I've mentioned, that's going to be important because some people, if they become Christians, their family may cut them off. They may end up breaking off relationships themselves that are unhealthy for them. They need that family as a support group that they can go to, they can have prayer. They may need to get a new job. They're going to need that family uh, sense. Uh, developing spiritual gifts of the people. So who has the gift of evangelism? Who has the gift of teaching? Who are the potential leaders? Uh, appointing a preliminary leadership team. I usually say don't appoint a long-term leadership team too soon in a church plant. Because in the initial days, the church is small. You don't have a lot of potential leaders there. In the initial phases, most of the people are new believers. You haven't seen how they've proven themselves in their faith over time. Paul said, don't appoint a person who's, who's new in the faith to be an elder. And so you, you, what you want is a preliminary leadership team 
that's a temporary team where people can give their input. They have a sense of ownership. This is our church, it's not somebody else's project. But at the same time, you don't want to be appointing somebody to say, well, for the next four years, you're the, one of the leaders of this church. You may want to pull, hold that off until you really see who are the faithful people, who are the exemplary followers of Christ, who are the ones who have those leadership skills. So you have a temporary preliminary team to get everybody involved, but you hold off on the longer term leaders. You meet regularly for corporate worship. Now again, you may not just start, well, next week we're going to have every Sunday a church service. It may be that you're getting this, you've got a cell group that started of, of new believers and they're growing and they, they want to worship and say, well, maybe we begin just once a month. Um, we don't want to overburden people with a lot of organizational and administrative and work. We want that to, the spiritual dynamic to keep going. Um, and we want the leaders to be trained to be able to take leadership in that. So you may have a monthly church service, or you may go every two weeks with a church service, but you begin that corporate worship. Um, you begin to reproduce cell groups. You formulate your values. What is your long-term development plan? Your philosophy of ministry begins to take shape. You've been on the ground for a while. You see the way you need to work in that community. And early along, you start teaching financial stewardship. Now, some people hold off. They say, well, new believers will get scared away if you talk about money and this sort of thing. I found it the other way around. New believers kind of assume that I'm committed to Christ. Christ loved me, and I want to do whatever I can for the cause of Christ. And so teaching people to give of their financial resources is a natural thing. And um, uh, this will lead to a strong church later on because people are committed to it. They're committed to Christ, they're committed to the advancement of the kingdom and this church, and they're willing to make financial commitments to make that happen. So we don't need to be shy about teaching financial stewardship early along in the life of these new believers. So the role here is to start becoming more of a mobilizer. You're not so much the motor, the doer, you're mobilizing and training others to do ministry as those ministries begin to grow. TVS Seminary is a great way to invest in the Kingdom of God. Please consider making a donation to support this effective educational and outreach ministry today. We exist upon your gracious giving. Please donate to support TVS Project's continuation and growth. For more information, visit tvsseminary.com.